Father Peter Bernardi of the Society of Jesus received his MA degree in philosophy from the University of Detroit, a Master of Divinity from the Toronto School of Theology, a license in sacred theology from the Western School of Theology, in prosecution of which he earned uh, general acclaim for his highly effective fadeaway jump shot. Also, um, he earned the PhD in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America. He's currently associate professor of theology at Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Thomas Kesselman is Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame. He holds a BA from St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia and the PhD from the University of Michigan. He's the author of Death and the Afterlife in Modern France and co-editor of Christian Democracy, Legacies and Comparative Perspectives. He's currently working on a book on the history of religious liberty in France in the aftermath of the French Revolution. Uh, William Poitier is the Mary Ann Spearin Chair of, uh, holder of the Mary Ann Spearin Chair of Catholic Theology in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton. Uh, he is the author of Isaac Hecker and the First Vatican Council and the author of Tradition and Incarnation. Um, so I would like uh, you all to uh, Welcome our panelists and invite uh, Father Bernardi to uh, commence the proceedings. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul and I entered the Jesuit novitiate together on the same day in 1976, and I thank him for the discretion with which he introduced me. He knows a lot more about me. But, uh, go ahead. Um, my heartfelt thanks to Lumen Christi and especially Thomas Levergood, its executive director, for uh, suggesting convoking the symposium, and special thanks to Professors Tom Kasselman and Bill Portier for making the trips from their uh, respective institutions to Chicago uh, to be part of this. How does the church realize its public mission? How do different theological and philosophical commitments influence the conception of the church's role in the public square? Um, the, the book, Blond Morris Blondell, Social Catholicism and Axion Francaise, sets out to analyze a, a dispute over what strategy should be adopted to re-Christianize society. Said dispute sharply divided French Catholics during the first decades of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> Blondell, uh, one of the uh, key disputants, uh, known as the uh, philosopher uh, Philosophe Dax, because he spent most of his career in Aix-en-Provence at the university there, in fact died there, um, <clears throat> pitted him uh, with a uh, young Jesuit philosopher named Pedro Deco. Uh, sounds Spanish, but it's uh, French. He was from Normandy. He later uh, founded the journal Archive, uh, Archive de Philosophie, and he taught almost 30 years uh, philosophy at the Jesuit Scholasticate on the island, uh, Isle of Jersey. Um, this dispute occurred at the height of the modernist crisis, uh, 1909 to 1914, uh, in a series of articles published in the French Jesuit journal Etude, Deco, uh, Soirees and Thomas, offered a qualified defense of an alliance between Catholics and the neo marnicus movement, Axion Francaise, whose brilliant ideologist was the agnostic positivist, Charles Maurras. The goal of this proposed alliance between uh, the Axion Francaise and Catholics was to oust the anti-clerical Third Republic, which indeed in 1905 uh, had exiled uh, congregations, uh, 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 <clears throat> had uh, ended the uh, concordat that Napoleon had uh, with the uh, Pope in the early uh, 1800s. And previously, uh, the law of congregations in 1901 had exiled uh, the Jesuits in their corporate uh, uh, <clears throat> works uh, from France. 
So the goal of the alliance was to oust this regime and reinstate the Roman Catholic Church as the official church of France. Um, uh, this end, this goal, accorded with the church's official teaching on the confessional state as the normative hypothesis, which was the official church teaching until Vatican II and Dignitatis Shimani. The Catholic alliance with Action Francaise received the support of prominent Thomists like Jacques Maritain, as well as highly placed ecclesiastics, both in France and in Rome, who adhered to the church's firm rejection of the liberalism that was the poison fruit of the Enlightenment and the French revolutionary tradition. These anti-liberal Catholics adhered to the syllabus of errors uh, promulgated by Pius IX back in the 1860s and refused any compromise with the spirit of the age. In contrast, uh, Blondel started his series of articles under the pseudonym uh, Testus, meaning witness, uh, to defend the democratic social Catholics against the charge of social modernism. Uh, and this, he was defending these social Catholics in the wake of the anti-modernist encyclical Pascendi promulgated by uh, Pope Pius X. And there was quite an anti-modernist backlash. Uh, so um, the Savant Social and other social Catholics uh, really fell on the defensive. So he, he comes forward to defend them. And in the course of composing this series of articles in 1910, uh, Blondel became aware of Decaux's articles for a qualify, qualified defense of uh, uh, Catholics uh, 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 collaborating with Oxion Francaise. And he roundly scored uh, Decaux's uh, defense as a prime illustration of a one sided ment mentality that he uh, made up a ne neologism for um, monophorism one-way street, a kind of extrinsicism. So Blondel was convinced that the stakes were, quote, the very understanding of the moral destiny and the religious conscience, unquote, and that the underlying issues, quote, transcend the horizon of the present controversies and concern the entire future of Catholicism itself among us, unquote. So in my brief time, I want to do three things. That was by way of introduction. Uh, I want to offer a brief, uh, very brief overview of the life uh, and philosophical career of Blondel. Uh, secondly, I want to offer a summary of three fundamental opposing uh, theses that Blondel identified as uh, pertaining to this dispute with Decaux. And then finally, uh, a brief assessment of uh, Blondel's significance for the renewal of Catholic thought with special attention to the nat nature-grace relationship. So from his adolescence, Blondel had a sense of vocation. Uh, he had a, he was a very sensitive uh, uh, person, had a keen awareness of the cultural crisis that was gripping his society. Um, he decided not to attend the local Jesuit college in Dijon. He, he said I, he, he insisted on going to the uh, secular, uh, the state school, quote, in order, quote, to know the state of soul of the enemies of the faith in order to be able to have a more efficacious action on them. He, this, is, this is his sense as a teenager. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And then he, um, so he has a strong sense of a, of a phil uh, philosophical vocation, uh, and he wants to defend Christian truth that was being uh, disparaged by the secular intelligentsia. So he gets into the prestigious Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, where he does his graduate studies, and he conceives of this strictly philosophical project that would show the illegitimacy of the reigning rationalist separated philosophy, which considered supernatural religion as utterly superfluous to self-sufficient reason's capacity to explain reality. In effect, he proposed a critical dialogue with modern philosophy, uh, very unlike what was going on in your typical Catholic seminary uh, instruction, which just viewed the moderns as enemies of the faith. He wanted to 
dialogue with the moderns, go in their door and come out his. Uh, accepting uh, the method of imminence, which is characteristic of modern philosophy, but repudiating its doctrine of imminence. So um, his original philosophy of the, of the supernatural first came to systematic expression in his uh, magnum opus, uh, his dissertation, L'Action, Action. And I bet many of you have heard the <clears throat> what, he's, uh, what he wrote in the beginning, yes or no, has life a meaning, and do human beings have a destiny? I act without knowing what action is, without having wished to live, without really knowing who I am. I am condemned to life, condemned to death, condemned to eternity. Why and by what right, if I have neither known it or willed it? His, his genius, of course, was to reflect on action as the link between thought and being. And he does a phenomenology of the will, um, <clears throat> the uh, constant uh, and uh, uh, attempt of the willing will <clears throat> to equal the willed will, or the willed will to equal the willing will. That is to say, human beings experience, uh, you know, a la Augustine, this uh, elan, this restlessness uh, within, uh, an inexhaustible, inexhaustible aspiration for the infinite that is never fully satisfied by all the specific concrete instances of willing. <clears throat> um, he argued that fidelity to the determinism of human action must lead to this, quote, doubly imperious conclusion. conclusion. It is impossible not to recognize the insufficiency of the whole natural order and not to feel an ulterior need. It is impossible to find oneself within oneself something to satisfy this re religious need. It is necessary and it is impracticable. The it refers to supernatural revelation that Blondell's secular university contemporaries uh, ignored or denied. So having disclosed the necessity for a supernatural completion of, uh, of our willing spirits, uh, Blondell's method of imminence claimed to show that the only option uh, was for the one thing necessary, that is supernatural religion, that could give ultimate meaning and coherence to the human project. Human efforts alone are pow powerless to bring this about, and so from the human side, supernatural fulfillment is impracticable. <clears throat> um, However, once the offer of supernatural completion becomes known, to deliberately close oneself off to it has moral consequences. Then the irrepressible human aspiration for the infinite will tend to absolutize some finite reality, what he referred to as superstition. And we know at the end of uh, L'Action, there's a uh, very uh, poignant uh, passage uh, where he gives his own testimony concluding the book with, it is, that is to say, supernatural revel revelation exists, but he, he says, I'm going beyond what I can say as a philosopher. I'm giving my, my personal testimony. <clears throat> well, this dissertation got him into hot water. It got him into hot water with the secular philosophical establishment who didn't like that he was messing with religion. They, they thought he had compromised uh, philosophy's um, <clears throat> independence its rationality, uh, thoroughgoing rationality. And then he got him in hot water with Catholic scholastic critics who uh, accused him of uh, confusing the natural and supernatural orders by claiming to make a case for the necessity of supernatural uh, fulfillment. Throughout his life, Blondell often felt misunderstood and even calumniated. Um, uh, a couple years ago, uh, Oliva Blanchette uh, wrote a you know, the fruit of a lifetime of study of Blondell, um, <clears throat> A Philosophical Life, which is a, a great, the best book in English to uh, uh, get a sense of Blondell's entire career. Blondell never reissued uh, L'Action because he thought he needed to make some clarifications. Uh, he goes blind in the 1920s, has to retire from teaching uh, at Aix, but continues to live there. And with the help of a faithful secretary, he issued a trilogy in the 1930s. Um, we can talk about that. Does his position change in the 1930s in response to the scholastic critics? He gets very involved with a, um, 
it's a, uh, a vigorous exchange over the nature of Christian philosophy uh, with uh, the likes of Jacques Maritain, uh, Etienne Gilson, and a num quite a number of other figures. Um, and that, uh, there's a book on that that came out a couple, a couple years ago, but that's worth, uh, one sh everybody should be aware of that aspect. Okay, that, that's uh, part one. Uh, part two, brief. Uh, in the Testus articles, okay, in which he uh, defends the social Catholics and then comes to criticize uh, the Marassian Catholics, uh, uh, people like De Coe who think that Catholics can have an alliance uh, with Oxion Frances, he contrasts these two mentalities according to three fundamental, three fundamental orientations. Um, one involving epistemology, secondly, ontology, and thirdly, theology, uh, uh, specifically uh, the nature-grace relationship. Um, he defends the thesis and epistemology uh, over against uh, a rationalist essentialism, um, that there is more to uh, uh, what we know than simply what our ideas, uh, uh, <clears throat> the concepts in our mind. And uh, that's really his philosophy of action. Um, it reminds me of the theological principle, Lakes Arandi, Lakes Credendi, uh, which is the practice of prayer is the pra indicates what is believed. And he's really indicating that in a uh, larger uh, uh, understanding, uh, perspective on human knowing, there's more in what we do than we can actually conceptualize. Uh, so he's cr criticizing a certain kind of uh, rash, uh, rationalistic essentialism. Uh, so that's thesis one. And he, of course, uh, uh, attributes to the um, uh, Catholic Marassians uh, a, a notional realism, this uh, a rationalist essentialism, that concepts uh, kind of grasp reality in some complete way, independent of human subjectivity and historicity. His second thesis has to do with um, ontology, and his argument there is that there is a, a solidarity and continuity in the different orders of reality. They can't simply be cordoned off in kind of like airtight, watertight compartments. Uh, so reality is inter interconnected in its various dimensions. Um, and again, he attributes to the uh, uh, the, mono, uh, the monophorists, the Catholic Marassians, a, a tendency to do exactly that, uh, not to see the uh, interaction of the different dimensions of reality. And he especially criticizes the influential social doctrine of Auguste Comte, which Maurras had adapted uh, Comtean positivism uh, as uh, uh, the philosophy that informed uh, uh, his approach in the political social arena. And Blondel declared, quote, deceptive and myopic, that social physics that desires to suffice for scientifically regulating public and private interests from a positivist point of view. He's not the only one criticizing positive this time. Of course, Henri Bergson, uh, uh, in a new review that he's associated with, began to criticize uh, Comte, uh, Comte and positive, which had been, he was an intellectual giant uh, through the middle into the late uh, 19th century. The third fundamental thesis is really the neural neuralgic thesis uh, uh, that I know Bill is going to speak to uh, as well. Con uh, it concerns the understanding of the nature-supernatural relationship. Blondell declared this thesis to be the most delicate of the disputed points, that which dominates the entire debate. While insisting that the supernatural order is entirely gratuitous and absolutely transcendent, um, against those who criticize Blondell of confusing them, uh, the na nature and supernatural, uh, conflating them. Uh, Blondell contended this order is not, only, uh, uh, is not only superimposed, but it is also supposed and presupposed by the natural order. So I quote from his, uh, <clears throat> from the testis. The supernatural order is destined to penetrate and to assume the natural order in itself without becoming confused with it. And at the same time that is proposed from on high by revelation, the incarnation and the redemption, which substantially constitute it, and which are not simply facts to observe and mysteries to believe, but reach souls invisibly by the effulgence of the grace of which they are the source, 
act upon all human beings, so to speak, from below to enable them to break out of all the enclosures in which they would like to confine themselves, to raise them above themselves, to burst every merely natural equilibrium, to put them on a level and require them to be in accord with the plan of providence. Um, at this point, he resolutely rejects the idea of a pure nature, the idea that human nature could be absolutely at home, uh, independent of uh, supernatural uh, fulfillment. <clears throat> On the other hand, the Catholic Marassians like Descartes separate the natural and supernatural orders so that the supernatural is treated as an external uh, superimposition, an overlay, uh, the, the two-layer cake, the image that's often used, or a two-story house. Uh, the supernatural order is considered uh, uh, a gratuitous superimposition by purely extrinsic command that relates to a purely passive obediential potency without the external gift being able or having to entail the help of an interior contribution. Specifically, supernatural truths are only supernatural in the measure that they are defined, named, and expressly imposed by way of authority. <clears throat> Monophorism was Blondell's term for a reigning clerical authoritarianism, which he uh, uh, attributed to the Catholic Marassians, which on principle refused to recognize that grace can be at work from below. Uh, Blondell finds a phrase in the Bishop uh, de, de Caen, uh, who was at Vatican I, uh, the phrase fe interieur. Namely, that there is this, uh, you know, a grace, anonymous grace that is at work from below. Um, and he accuses the uh, uh, deco and, and the uh, extrinsicists of not recognizing that. And he blamed the manualist theology for uh, perversion of the tradition on that. So limitations of time preclude an exposition of Decaux's response, but let me just mention this. Decaux kind of saw himself as a, a, a modern day Thomas Aquinas doing for Maras what Aquinas did for Aristotle. So he likens him just as Aquinas appropriates Aristotle in a you know, discretionary way. There's obviously aspects of Aquinas, uh, Aristotle that don't fit into Christian doctrine. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, too, um, Descartes recognizes uh, aspects of Maurras that uh, uh, are not uh, inimical to, uh, to Catholic doctrine, but he can be um, appropriated in a, in a, in a, in a qualified way. Um, in the short run, it seemed Blondell lost the battle. Uh, um, this was a, a very painful time at the church in the, in the modernist context. Uh, his journal was condemned by the Office of the Index and went out of existence in 1913, the oldest uh, Catholic uh, philosophical journal at that time. Um, he submitted docilely to uh, Rome's decision on that. It was rumored that Oxion Frances played a role in having his, uh, the journal uh, condemned. But I, I was in the archives of the Holy Office this summer in Rome, I couldn't find anything, uh, no smoking gun or whatever in the uh, dossier they gave me. Um, and then um, uh, Moraz's uh, uh, sway with Catholic youth reached a peak in the early 1920s. It alarmed uh, Pope Pius XI and uh, seemingly out of the blue in the fall of 1926, uh, Catholic affiliation with Oxen Francaise was condemned. It was forbidden to read the newspaper. Uh, Marat's works, several of them were put on the index. Uh, that index was, uh, was uh, published. It actually it goes back to Pius X. And severe canonical pen penalties were imposed on defiant Catholics. Amid great consternation, the French Jesuit Louis Biot, a uh, sympathizer of Oxygen Francaise, even uh, uh, quotes uh, Maras in his work De Ecclesia, 1910 work De Ecclesia. Um, he was the outstanding dogmatic theologian in Rome in the pre-World War I era. He was forced, the only cardinal forced to resign his red hat and unceremoniously 
departed Rome. He was a close advisor to Pius X, but in Pius XI, he was on the outs. Uh, and he lived four more years re-editing his works. He removed the reference to Morass in the fifth or fourth edition of De Ecclesia. And, uh, and uh, he dies at peace. And I, went, I was told by a Jesuit who had seen it when I was doing this project 20 years ago, uh, Merle Vogel was still alive in the community here at Loyola Chicago. He had been in Rome, in Italy in 1929 and had seen B.O. and said B.O. was serene, was at peace. There was no bitterness about what happened. Uh, anyways, assessment, third part, uh, even briefer. Uh, the arguments over nature grace have been characterized as the most bitter disputes in Roman Catholic theology in the 20th century. They are not gone. <laughs> uh, they've been revived. De Lubac gave primary credit to Blondel for having launched the decisive attack on the dualist theory, this extrinsicism that uh, Blondel uh, described as monophorism um, that was destroying Christian thought. He praised Blondel for having demonstrated the deficiencies of this extrinsicist school. Um, <clears throat> Furthermore, Blondel's trenchant analysis in these testis series was described by Hans Urs von Balthasar as, quote, the most penetrating analysis of this phenomenon of Catholic integralism that represents, quote, an ever reoccurrent temptation for militant Catholics. Blondell is credited as a major catalyst for the renewal that bore fruit at Vatican II. I want to reference uh, Bill Portier's uh, essay in Communio two years ago entitled 20th Century Catholic Theology and the Triumph of Morris Blondell. So he uh, uh, <clears throat> sketches that, uh, that history, that influence. Um, the dispute has been revived uh, with these resource montomas. We could talk about that in the question and answer period. I want to reference Ed Oakes and please say a prayer for him. He's, uh, of course, um, uh, in, the, in, in the final stage of pancreatic cancer. And he uh, has um, really written a lot of wonderful essays um, in the uh, 2007 Novit Vetera, a long issue on this nature grace, and then this past summer. Uh, another essay on nature and grace and, and, and shaven, but uh, I can't go into that here. Um, so um, I want to suggest three analogies that I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to mention them. I don't have time to develop them. I was thinking uh, in the book I mentioned two ways of imagining, uh, two different ways of relating nature and grace, so architectural images. So the two-story house, the two-layer cake, well, I'll stay with the two-story two house. That would, uh, uh, symbolize, uh, image, this extrinsicist relationship uh, between uh, nature and the supernatural that uh, Blondel attributed to uh, Descartes and the, and the manualist uh, uh, tradition. Um, the critics of Blondel saying that he was confusing nature and grace, we could liken that to the pantheon. Okay, imagine the Pantheon, uh, for argument's sake, has no source of light. Uh, there obviously aren't any windows in the Pantheon, but even the doors are closed. So you're inside the Pantheon, the only source of light is the oculus up above. That would be grace. And his critics are saying, it's only because of grace that you have any assurance of knowledge. Uh, that, of course, um, then would argue that uh, you know, Aristotle and other uh, pagan philosophers wouldn't uh, you know, uh, have the capacity to come up with truths in the natural order, or for that matter, in the Catholic tradition, uh, which has always been recognized that there are truths in the natural order that you don't need revelation to, uh, to uh, apprehend. Uh, so that was the, uh, what was attributed to him. I want to suggest, which I didn't suggest in a book, a third image, namely an A-frame an house, which uh, conveys that there is a solidity to the lower level. There are windows, natural truths. You can apprehend natural truths. But the, uh, the lower level is not complete. Uh, so there is uh, this, if you will, exigency for... Uh, a supernatural completion. I could say more about those images, but time uh, prevents that. Um, 
Vatican II, when uh, the pastoral constitution urges an anthropology of unitary human destiny, quote, since the ultimate vocation of human beings is in fact one, you could argue that uh, uh, that's what Blondell was, uh, that's what he was arguing. Uh, <clears throat> B.O. wrote a six-part series, I want to give a presentation on this, The Last Hurrah of Limbo, arguing that most of humanity were moral infants and would be, uh, be in limbo. Um, <clears throat> so nothing of that in Vatican II. Uh, there isn't a, uh, a third possibility apart from damnation and uh, um, <clears throat> union with God. Um, uh, Congar uh, praised uh, uh, Blondell at the end of Vatican II, quote, if one had to characterize in a word the council's approach, I would appeal to the ideal of knowledge which Morris Blondell proposed and which he defended against what he rather strangely termed monophorism. That is a reified conception of knowing. That was Congar's appreciation of Blondell at end of Vatican II. And then finally, um, I just want to mention two um, other appreciations of Blondell. Uh, in two publications, in which Blondell is the unnamed philosopher. Um, Peter Enrici wrote an essay on uh, Pope John Paul's encyclical on faith and reason, Fides et Ratio, uh, in Communio a number of years ago, called The One Who Went Unnamed, Morris Blondell in the encyclical Fides et Ratio. And indeed, in Fides et Ratio, it does uh, um, express an appreciation for those uh, philosophers, but without naming Blondell by name, who start with an analysis of, of imminence opening the way to the transcendent. And that's certainly what Blondell uh, uh, intended to do. And then the other un, uh, work where Blondell is unnamed, but he ought to have been named, is uh, Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. If you read chapter 15, The Imminent Frame, <laughs> Blondell uh, should be brought into a, a, a dialogue with uh, what uh, Taylor talks about there. There's not, no reference to uh, Blondell at all in A Secular Age. But, uh, thank you. Thanks for your patience. I think I went over time. <laughs> Thank you. I now uh, ask uh, Professor Kasselman to. Uh, no, oh, to okay. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here, and I thank Thomas Levergood for the invitation to be here this morning and Pete for writing his book uh, which I've spent many hours working on. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, this presentation, this, this response has two parts. The first part is called Bernardi the Even-Handed and the second part is on nature and grace since I'm a theologian and that's what I'm supposed to talk about. Okay, one of the most striking aspects of Peter Bernardi's excellent and thoroughly researched book is the surprising even-handedness with which he treats the two main subjects of his study, Maurice Blondel and Pedro de Coe. He takes admirable pains to be fair to both men. This is a quote from Bernardi. In the controversy between Blondel and de Coe, neither disputant can claim a total victory. Each had important insights that were corrective of the other's positions. Indeed, each modified his views in the light of criticism. Bernardi has convinced me that Blondel did indeed change his position to accommodate the pure nature hypothesis of modern scholasticism. As Stephen Schlosser points out in his review, Blondel is the initially sympathetic figure in this story. This is why the even-handedness is interesting. I remain struck by Bernardi's fairness toward de Coe and his unwillingness, in the words of Jacques Prévotat, openly to take Blondel's part. Schlosser applauds Bernardi's even-handedness. He interprets de Coe's strict nature supernatural distinction as freeing him, freeing de Coe, to preserve what he calls an open space for alternative possible linkages between religious ideas, formal principles, and concrete political structures, material facts. 
Such a linkage was the alliance between monarchist French Catholics of the Third Republic and Charles Maurras' Action Francaise. Eerily and unexpectedly, Schlosser writes, Decoe evokes another Jesuit theologian who would later draw similar distinctions, albeit for opposite political aims, John Courtney Murray. Schlosser doesn't question whether there can actually be such an open space, as implied by Murray's article of, Articles of Peace Interpretation of the First Amendment. What attracts him here is Bernardi's seeming rejection of any form of the synthetic impulse that tends to identify Christianity too closely with political causes of either left or right. In Tom Kesselman's formulation in his review, Bernardi warns against the tendency to read the divine into any political ideology. On the first page of his book, Bernardi cites Jacques Prévotat's 2001 work on Catholics and Action Française as the magisterial study of the history of the relationship between French Catholics and Action Française. Prévotat has written two long and laudatory reviews of Bernardi's book, but he seems as dismayed as Schlosser is happily surprised at Bernardi's even-handed treatment of Blondel and Decoe. Seeming to borrow an image from European football, Prévota asks with a touch of exasperation, is it possible to appear to conclude such a wide-ranging debate with the verdict of a goalless draw? His subtitle, History of a Condemnation, signals Prévota's view that Decoe's position was discredited by the condemnation of Pius XI in which the future Pius XII concurred. Blondel inspired Jesuit resistance to the Nazis and Vichy, and through Henri de Lubac and others, eventually carried the day at the Second Vatican Council. Prévotat wants Bernardi to admit that Blondel won this match. His speculations on why Bernardi decided not to openly take Blondel's part look to developments in the world of Anglophone theology, such as John Milbank's 2005 study of Henri de Lubac, The Suspended Middle, and the simultaneous resurgence of interest in the first decade of the 21st century, especially among certain Dominicans in Cajetan and the tradition of commentary on St. Thomas. Uh, Professor Bernardi mentioned the the resurgence of interest in, in, in these, these, uh, this, this body of literature in his presentation. They are careful to distinguish the, their tradition from Decoe's Jesuit Suarezianism. This goes along with a renewal of interest in Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, longtime nemesis in the matter of nature and grace to Blondel's disciple Henri de Lubac. Garrigou is the subject of two recent biographies by Richard Petticord and Aidan Nichols. Though the even-handedness dis disconcerts him somewhat, Prévota concludes that Bernardi's treatment of the controversy allows readers to appreciate both its distance from and its proximity to our present situation. Writing in a, in a church torn by political strife Bernardi provides a nonpartisan exposition of this debate. He backs it up with nearly 300 pages of rigorous scholarship in which Prévota could only find three very minor errors. I applaud both his scholarship and his ironic intent, but his even-handedness tends to obscure the asymmetry of the respective positions Blondel and Decaux occupied on the French theological political landscape of 1909 through 1914. This could not merely be an intellectual dispute. Blondel and Decoe wrote in the aftermath of the anti-modernist encyclical Pascendi, with its concluding mandate for diocesan vigilance committees and censorship of theological books. The imposition of the oath against modernism in 1910 and the suppression only months after Blondel wrote the last testis in 1910 of Le Sion, 
the Blondell-inspired Social Catholic Network and its journal of the same name. Powerful support from prestigious neo-Thomists in Rome and France lent to Action Francaise what Alexander drew long ago in, in the 60s called an aura of hyper-orthodoxy. Without denying the real substance of Bernardi's careful exposition of their intellectual differences, it must be said that Decoe's raising the specter of modernism is in such an overheated environment was more like a threat than a form of intellectual exchange. Such threats add an ominous layer of meaning to Decoe's arguments. Bernardi makes this clear, for example, at 155 and 156 in the book, but it is lost in the concluding emphasis on mutual vindication. With Prevota, I am convinced that Blondel won this fight decisively. Nevertheless, I remain deeply intrigued by the even-handedness of Bernardi's scholarship. I don't find either Milbank or the resurgent Thomists behind it. I would like to hear from Bernardi what inspired his approach. Was it simply driven by the evidence, which would be the obvious reply, or was it in any part a function of our present theological political situation? In this connection, I was brought up short. I was, I was convicted, as the evangelicals would, would say, uh, by Bernardi's comparison of Blondel's systematization of monophorisma an outsider term which, which you know, Decoe never used, with Pashendi's systematization of modernism, another outsider term which the people that have come to be known as modernists never used, and his question of whether in using this Blondel had overreached. This comparison is a highlight in Bernardi's gradual dissolution of what Nicholas Lash has called the John Wayne's Arizona approach to studying the modernist crisis with good guys and bad guys. This striking comparison comes right before the treatment of Blondel's response to Decoe in the last two Testis articles. It also underlines the question of what Decoe was really about. Before turning to that, uh, one brief other question for Professor Bernardi. He mentioned uh, Blanchette's biography of Blondel um, Blanchette thinks that it's unlikely that Decoe knew the identity of Testis, that he knew that Blondel was Testis. And so I, I just wondered what you thought about that. You probably talk about it in your review, but I couldn't find your review last night. So um, back to the question of what Decoe was really about. I think this is important for contemporary purposes. Writing in the first year of Vatican II in 1963, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who Pete also mentioned, cited Blondel's 1910 collection of the Testis articles and described it as, as Pete read to you. He went on to contrast love as the form of revelation with the approach of the Catholic partisans of Action Francaise who saw themselves as an orthodox alternative to modernism. He denounced this approach as an effort which he described as to shut down the opponent through an unintellectual and unspiritual use of force. Balthazar's contrast of love and force raises the question of whether the political choices supported by Decoe were simply ad hoc collaboration with unbelievers or whether what Kasselman calls his choice of order over liberty, allowing him to justify authoritarianism, really involved something like the imposition of Catholicism by force on the citizens of the Third Republic. I'm, I'm not clear about that. Um, Blondel's violent metaphor of a war machine, an instrument of earthly reign, surely suggests the latter. Blondel located the fundamental error of Catholic Moresians in their failure to recognize the inner working of the divine gift, the doubly religious spontaneity of souls that are under the action of both grace and liberty. I leave to professors Bernardi and Kesselman, who are more competent than I, to answer it 
this question of the extent to which the co-advocated, what the co-advocated really did involve the imposition of Catholicism by force in France. So that's the first part, nature and grace. Uh, it's dangerous to talk about nature and grace, but I'm going to try. As I said above, <clears throat> I remain convinced that Blondel won this match. As Prevotas suggests, Blondel's after traces reach through de Lubac and others to the Second Vatican Council's affirmation in the deeply Christological first part of Gaudium et Spes of the final calling of all human beings as one, one final calling, one final calling, and divine. But something has happened along the way during the years since 1965, and I suspect that that helps to account for Bernardi's even-handedness, but I'd like to hear what he says about that. Reviewers are at one in locating the intellectual heart of this book at the issue of nature and grace, and in praising Bernardi as a careful and accurate guide through such a tortured theoretical terrain. My own view is that a theology of nature and grace is always, as Blondel might say, on the way. And given our transitory participation by grace in the ongoing divine economy, it cannot be articulated once and for all. In view of his notion of the ebb and flow of theology, de Lubac might not have been surprised that a Blondel-inspired theology of nature and grace, rather than a once-for-all achievement, has over the last 50 years proven unstable and unfinished, too tied perhaps to the circumstances of the Third Republic in which Blondel first articulated it. On the one side, over, over the past 50 years, undifferentiated appeals to the graced character of our world threatened to evacuate the Christological center of a Blondel-inspired theology of nature and grace, such as we find in de Lubac. Reassertions of philosophical autonomy on the other side in appeals to the Preambula Fidei in the Summa and Vatican I's dogmatic constitution Dei Filius unsettle the Christological center of this theology from another side. As if to signal this war for the center, de Lubac's own theology of nature and grace, perhaps through John Milbank's eccentric advocacy, finds itself topical again. Beset of late from both right and left, de Lubac has become a contested site, something like the state of Ohio for contemporary arguments over the legacy of Vatican II and the future of Catholic theology, particularly with respect to the role of Thomism vis-a-vis -vis forms of thought closer to the legacy of Maurice Blondel. Bernardi has argued against Blanchet's emphasis on continuity in Blondel, that Blondel adjusted his position in response to Decoe and other neo-scholastic critics to accommodate the pure nature hypothesis. A corresponding case could be made that from the conclusion of Surnaturel in 1946, where de Lubac uses exigence with no qualification, through the, his articles in Recherche de Sciences Religieuses in 1948 and 1949, to the mystery of the supernatural in 1965, and his memoir translated as At the Service of the Church in 1993, de Lubac similarly adjusted his position in response to critiques centered on the concept of pure nature. It is unlikely that de Lubac ever forgot Blondel's warning given to him in a letter of April 5, 1932, to avoid, quote, the bad habit of considering that the state in which the supernatural vocation places us eliminates the state of nature, and Blondel's reminder that our de facto supernatural final end, quote, does not prevent the radical heterogeneity of the first gift of rational life and the second, parenthesis, and antecedent in the order of finality, close parenthesis, gift of the supernatural. As Blondel's language suggests, de Lubac's solution 
was to make simultaneous these two heterogeneous gifts. He called this the twofold marvel of gratuitousness, the datum optimum nature and the donum perfectum supernatural grace for which he thought the analogy of human gift remained inadequate. Contemporary arguments about nature and grace are a morass in which it is all too easy to lose the way. They involve questions about how to read Aquinas, who never explicitly considered the pure nature hypothesis, how to understand Aquinas on things like obediential potency and dual finality, and this is where Pete mentioned limbo. Limbo is big in this, in this argument. So if there's, if there's a natural finality that extends beyond this world, that's, that's what limbo is about. So limbo, limbo is hot. Limbo is, is a big part of this debate. So I'm glad that Pete mentioned it. OK, so, so this is a big string of things that discussing nature and grace involves. And the first one is, what does Aquinas mean by all this, all this stuff? And then, how to read Cajetan reading Aquinas, and de Lubac reading Thomas and Cajetan, how to understand the preamble of Fidei in the, in the Summa, and especially the teaching of Dei Filius at Vatican I, that God can be known with certainty from the consideration of created things by the natural power of human reason. This, this is like, you know, you could write poems about pe what people have said about this. This is not even to consider how Francisco Suarez might fit into this picture. These debates are likely to continue, and, you know, there's no way that I could possibly ever get a handle on all of this, all of these issues. I don't there are only a few people who might be able to do that. Um, so these debates are likely to continue, and that is a good thing. But given this morass, it is good to keep in mind a kind of bottom line that I take from David Schindler. He calls it the double burden presented, presented by the gospel, an utterly gratuitous gift on God's part coupled with the human person's profound, non-arbitrary desire for this gift, both of these being already present at the beginning of each creature's existence. That's sort of what, what you have to do justice to in any theology of nature and grace. In the light of the instability of our thinking about nature and grace, Bernardi's sense of the importance of Decoe's insistence on some autonomy for natural reason appears salutary and timely. Though we, not, we may not be able to articulate with the precision we might like, or that certain people might like, what Gaudium et Spes calls the justa or recta autonomia of reason, an autonomy proper to created things, we know that even if with de Lubac we dechronologize the, the two gifts, without this autonomy, we cannot conceive supernatural grace. Without this autonomy in some quo modo. Considering our present situation of an internally divided church in the midst of a nation whose laws look increasingly like those of the Third Republic rather than the reflection of natural law tradition, Murray hoped for in the last chapter of We Hold These Truths, Bernardi's even-handedness raises another important question. I think this is a really important question and I want to talk about it. How much does or can one's theology of nature and grace really have to do with our political choices as acts of practical reason? Do political choices really flow from a theology of nature and grace? Can we expect them to be entirely consistent with such a theology? As was French Catholicism during the first decades of the 20th century, our church is internally divided, the Catholic Church, over how to live as Catholics on an ever more secular political landscape. 
As with the earlier French, both camps of warring contemporary Catholics in the United States accuse the other of unacceptable cooperation with unbelievers. This is why the question of what the co was really about is important. In this context, Schlusser's comparison of the co with John Courtney Murray is instructive, but not perhaps in the way that he intends. Both the co and Murray were religious nationalists of different sorts. For Decoe and the Maurasians, Axion Francaise held out the possibility of restoring a Catholic monarchy to the patrie, the church's eldest daughter. As an, as an American exceptionalist, Murray thought that the First Amendment saved Catholics in the United States from this restorationist predicament of Decoe and his compatriots. Murray believed in a certain fit between the founders who builded better than they knew and the Catholic natural law tradition. In the penultimate chapter of We Hold These Truths, he admitted that this fit was eroding among Americans. He described the barbarian in the Brooks Brothers suit at the gates of the city. And this is, this is funny from 1960, he's carrying a ballpoint pen. Murray thought this signaled the, the demise of Western civilization. Um, anyway, I, I just thought that was, that was pretty funny. In the last chapter, however, <clears throat> he voiced his hope that Catholics still had natural law and that they would, in a sense, save America. So John Courtney Murray died in 1967. It is difficult to imagine, possibly, possibly, how Murray could now write the last chapter entitled The Doctrine Lives. Developments in American jurisprudence from Griswold versus Connecticut, which took place in his lifetime, to Roe versus Wade, to the recent overturning of Doma, and the lack of any functioning concept of the common good, chart a clear trajectory away from any sort of fit with Catholic natural law thinking. So this leaves us with Atlas shrugged wielding Catholics who want to dismantle government social programs and hand them over to intermediate institutions. And we have left leaning Catholics who support government sponsored health care programs for the sake of the common good with some provision, underlined some for conscientious objection. It strikes me that neither of these groups can claim obvious moral superiority over the other in terms of some theology of nature and grace. Maybe they can, but not in terms of some theology of nature and grace. Okay, now I lost my place. It is not clear to me that our situation is analogous to that of the Morazian Catholics and the social Catholics of Blondell's day. That would be worth discussing. In the, in the time of Ayn Rand, gay marriage, HHS mandates, and the Tea Party, we are on our own. But we cannot simply withdraw. We are left with politics as Aristotle understood it, and something like Blondel's personalist vision of Catholics as a leavening presence through whom life and love might circulate in a secular environment. This is how he explained Le Sion and what, what he wanted to do. In this situation, I find hope and nourishment in the writings of the generations of French Catholics who came of age in the 20th century under the Third Republic and went on to inspire the Second Vatican Council. I am grateful to Peter Bernardi for a truly thought-provoking book and to you for your attention. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to be brief because I want to make sure there's enough time for Peter to answer questions. And uh, some of the things that I'll say actually echo from a slightly different perspective what, what Bill was talking about. Um, 
What I want to do is basically two things. First of all, I'm a French historian with uh, limited, to say the least, training in theology and philosophy. I spent a lot more time reading the correspondence between bishops and clergy about slapping kids at First Communion classes or shutting down a shrine or how to carve up a cemetery than I do in reading philosophy and theology, although I've, I've done some work in intellectuals. So my approach is, is going to be very much from the perspective of French history and a French historian uh, with an interest uh, in religion. And I think that's different from uh, the work of Peter, which is uh, very clear from his own comment today, uh, primarily an intervention in uh, philosoph philosophical and theological uh, debates. Uh, uh, France shows up, in fact, after the Latin American theologians on page one of his book. Um, so let me begin uh, with uh, some political context that I think uh, is alluded to briefly, but I think can help us understand what's going on with de Kock and Blondel uh, in, in this period. Bernardi's story occurs in the French Third Republic. And that's a term that comes up, and afterwards there'll be a quiz. Can you name all five republics and when they were? But I, I, I don't know if you'll be able to. It's a regime which emerged in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris Commune in 1870-71. And all the standard histories of this period acknowledge the crucial importance of Catholicism and of church-state conflict in defining the political and cultural atmosphere of this period, 1870 to 1914 in particular. In the 1880s, the Republican leader, Leon Gambetta, famously announced clericalism, there is the enemy. A clarion call that announced a Republican assault on the institutional church. Although a Catholic school system managed to survive and in fact still survives and in some ways flourishes in France today, in the 1880s, the state created a system of obligatory, free, secular education that taught the vast majority of French students about their duties as French citizens with religion uh, pushed out of the classroom very, very self-consciously. Divorce was instituted. Cemeteries were secularized. Catholic processions as religious expression in the public sphere was carefully regulated. Religious congregations were particularly targeted. As many as 30,000 priests, brothers, and sisters were expelled from France following the law on associations in 1901. And as uh, I think Peter mentioned briefly, this uh, Republican assault on the church culminated in the law separating church and state in 1905, ending a troubled marriage that had lasted ever since the treaty between Napoleon and the church in 1801. Taken together by the early 20th century, the Third Republic had put into place the system of laïcité, a term that is still used. And maybe you followed the, 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 the recent demonstrations in France over the, the issue of, of gay marriage in which uh, laïcité was once again uh, uh, in, in public debate. It's a principle in which individuals are free to adopt any religious belief they choose, but are severely constrained from bringing their beliefs into the political and public domain. It's the Third Republic, and really precisely in this period, that that very uh, typical French principle is articulated and put into place. The anti-clerical campaign of Gambetta and the Third Republic was not unopposed. Catholic political leaders, such as Albert Dumain, and Monsignor Freppel, the Bishop of Angers, were able to mount a substantial response. And the electoral results weren't always uh, a, a huge majority in favor of the Republic. The Catholics, at certain moments, uh, almost managed to regain the majority, but never managed to do so. So laïcité remained in place. This capsule history represents the standard narrative of the period from the perspective of French history, in which the lines are clearly drawn between monolithic entities, the Republican state, and the Catholic Church. Republicans defend individual human rights, democratic institutions, modest social reforms. The Catholic Church, even though there are some who uh, identify with the Republic in the 1890s, and I'll come back to that issue of the rally to the Republic in the 1890s, uh, most Catholics remain committed to the monarchy with l'Action Francaise movement that is so central to Peter's work uh, being the, the most extreme example of Catholic attachment to a return of the French monarchy. Um, if you wanted to um, bring to mind a, 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 a 
uh, the, the most standard example of church-state conflict in this period, you might think of the Dreyfus Affair, uh, the issue in the 1890s and that was culminated in 1904 with the exoneration of Captain Dreyfus, a, a Jewish officer in the French military falsely accused of treason the uh, Catholic uh, uh, Church, in particular the Assumptionist Order, took a lead in attacking Dreyfus. The uh, anti-Semitic newspaper of the Assumptionist, La Croix, uh, was perhaps the leading uh, 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 attacker of Dreyfus. And it is the Assumptionist uh, paper and its attack on Dreyfus that actually explains more than any other particular issue the law and associations that drives the French congregations out of France. So in other words, there's this very, very heated political context uh, in the Third Republic that is the background for this uh, debate between de Kock and Blondel. Um, one of the great uh, achievements of Bernardi from the perspective of a French historian is that he, uh, he forces us to look inside these monolithic entities as they're presented in the standard narrative of church and state and see on the, on the part of the Catholic Church this deep antagonism inside that institution. Now, I know that Catholic modernists and the literature on modernism, that's nothing new to them. But my understanding of that literature is that it doesn't uh, uh, always attend very, very specifically to the relationships between debates over biblical interpretation and theology and politics. So what Peter is doing is bringing the, uh, the intellectual debates that are familiar to specialists in modernism to the attention, I would hope, of French historians and, and, and seeing uh, the, the, de the internal debates as political and social. Now this is not, it's not that this is an unknown uh, uh, dimension of French history, but I think Peter's work really contributes to pulling apart that kind of uh, uh, tendency to see church versus state rather than look beneath the surface. And I want to mention that his book in, in a certain sense resembles a very, very good recent book by Ruth Harris from the University of Oxford on the Dreyfus Affair, which, in which she also challenges these, these categories. So that's the, my, my capsule history. What I want to do now, uh, and I want to make sure that I don't spend too much time because I want to give time, is, is uh, raise some questions, and some of them will be familiar because Bill has already, I think, uh, pointed some of them out. And the first one has to do with this political context that I've just talked about. And let me read a quote from Blondel in which uh, he takes on the uh, extrinsic monophorism. One of the things I liked about the book is now I can at cocktail parties bring up the issue of extrinsic monophorism and really make a big impression. Here's what he says about extrinsic monophorism. In monophorism, nature is not assumed by the supernatural and does not ascend into it. So this, he's criticizing the, the, this, this dualism. It is the supernatural, according to its desire, that releases from above down a sign that serves as material for reasoning. So he's critical of this uh, from the top down movement. A command that is imposed on the lower level, purely receptive and in fact totally passive. From below up, there is only activity on command, uniquely destined to rationally enthrone the higher level by conferring on it a dictatorship rationally exercised and rationally without control. I think the language there is very interesting and the term dictatorship is especially significant to me in thinking about this relationship between philosophical and theological and political issues because it suggests not only a philosophical but also a political uh, a, a difference that is based on specific institutions. He's against dictatorship, he's for what? There is not any real reference in Peter's book to politics. Uh, the Action Francaise movement defends monarchy. Blondel, in defending uh, social Catholicism, doesn't seem to engage with the political question of whether or not Catholics should rally to the Republic, an issue that is raised uh, in the 1890s uh, by Pope Leo XIII, who calls on Catholics to accept the Republic. And so one of the questions I have is where does Blondel stand, not with regard to social policy where the, his position is clear, but where does he stand with politics? Is he hesitant, nervous to accept democratic political institutions? It seems to me that one of the things that might be going on here is the, I think what's 
and I'm not an expert here at all, is the, is the tendency for Catholic social thought to be way ahead of political thought. So that in terms of social theory, Catholicism, the Catholic Church, sounds pretty progressive if you think about Rerum Navarum, but in terms of politics, it's only after World War II that you get an acceptance of democratic institutions. And so there's a kind of a gap here that might be, that Blondel uh, might be illustrating in the period before World War I. What I want to do now is just give you uh, some final quick comments uh, about uh, questions that arose. I wrote a review, as, as Bill cited it very nicely, uh, uh, that was a, a very positive review, and in part, positive because um, of Peter's ability to take very difficult philosophical concepts and explicate them nicely. But let me now just raise some, some particular questions. One, the relationship between theology and philosophy on the one hand and politics and Peter's suggestion that um, there is uh, an enthrallment, is the word he uses it is in conclusion, uh, of a uh, of, uh, of politics to theology and philosophy that needs to be avoided. So in the conclusion of his book, he, he looks at de Cook and Blondel and takes a view that they, these ought to be looked at carefully and perhaps distinguished. And it seems to me the evidence of his book suggests something very, very different. And in fact, it suggests that the two cannot be separated in a modern era of massed politics and social mobilization. And so that I, I, I find myself uh, puzzled by this tension between this, uh, this suspicion of, the, uh, of political agendas when the book suggests that, I, it seems to me, the impossibility of separating uh, these two elements. Um, and a, a related point, how does the influence flow between these dimensions, between the philosophical and theolo theological and the political? This is a work uh, of high ideas and of theology and philosophy, and the argument is, 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 I think, perfectly clear that, and I accept it to a significant degree, that there's a flow from theology, philosophy, to political agenda. But if you think about my political narrative, it seems to me that the influence is also working in the other direction. And as a historian who's not um, a, a philosopher or a theologian, I wonder, I have doubts about whether or not the flow is as much in the direction that Peter suggests and whether or not there isn't a flow upward. Whether or not de Cook, who is an authoritarian fill in the blank, isn't drawn to his philosophical position in part because of the politics of the situation, and, I, and, and, and if you think about the history of the French church, it's not just the Third Republic, but the entire history of 19th century France that is seen as an assault on the church. And that political context seems to me a powerful force that argues for keeping these two uh, 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 together in, in the way in which we look at it, and in not seeing the influence of of the intellectual dimension to the politics as uh, the primary or exclusive. And I don't think Peter does that, but the, the, the nature of the book does nonetheless uh, suggest that. Even handedness. This is the, the, the comment that Bill made, and I, it's a term that I use, and I agree with the reviews of Prevotat, which I hadn't read, and I was glad to hear about them, that there's, it seems to me that in, when, you, when I read the book, there, although there is a, a, a fairness involved, it seems to me Peter's sympathies are on the side of Blondel. And then you get to the conclusion, and we see this kind of, well, on the one hand and on the other hand. And, and uh, I, I found that puzzling, as did Bill. And I'd like, I'd like to hear more, more about that. And finally, I'll conclude on this point. Uh, uh, I, th I think I would disagree with, with Bill a little bit about the, the, the triumph of Blondel. Uh, in, in the end. It seems to me that there's a redemptive note in that comment, and in Peter's book he talks about, in 1947, Maurice Blondel's son in 1947 addressing the, uh, the revived institution of the Semaine Sociale, and, and, and it's, 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 it's heartwarming. You know, Blondel seems to have won, but remember, Blondel had been silenced for much of the first half of the 20th century. His journal had been shut down, 
And that follows a century in which the Catholic Church repeatedly resisted efforts to accommodate in some reasonable way to the modern world. The syllabus of errors is just the most obvious example of that. And with that history as background and thinking about even the last 50 years, not from the perspective of theology and philosophy, but just of the, 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 the status of the institutional church in the world, is it so clear that this position of accommodation to the modern world is really one? Maybe because Francis II has now issued a survey uh, to parishioners in which he's consulting the, the laity, right, on, 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 uh, on church policy. That seems to me a Blondellian move in which uh, you have the hierarchy reaching out. I don't know if it exactly corresponds to the relationship of nature and grace, but it, it, I, I wanted to conclude by posing the question whether or not there is a Blondellian dimension in Francis II. Sorry I went on so long, thank you. I'd like to thank both respondents for their very instructive remarks, and I invite uh, Father Bernardi to respond. So, let's get your fine here. I'll, I'll start with uh, maybe the, the easiest question. Uh, did Descartes know that Testos was Blondel? Um, certainly, uh, he did know at some point of the dispute, I don't know exactly when, because uh, he um, singles out uh, Blondel's um, uh, collaboration with uh, the rector at Aix, who was a, you know, a, a secularist, and the fact that he was willing to collaborate with him, uh, indicating well, you're, you're being kind of hypocritical here. You're criticizing me because I'm open to collaborating with Maras while you're collaborating with this guy. Uh, but I am, um, um, Blanchett had the immense advantage of uh, having worked on Blundell for 50 years. Uh, he's still uh, alive and uh, working at Boston College. He also had the advantage of meeting with uh, Mademoiselle Panis, uh, Natalie Panis, who was a uh, uh, close uh, uh, secretary with uh, Blundell when Blundell went blind and presumably knew uh, all kinds of things about Blundell's. Uh, and I don't know, but he doesn't indicate that he talked to her specifically about that. But uh, um, Let me make a distinction between uh, understanding the dispute, uh, assessing the dispute, my even-handedness about the dispute, and then contemporary applications. I think that's, and does nature and grace, uh, does it matter <laughs> in political options and whatnot? Um, I do think Blondell uh, was... Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the more perceptive in the dispute. Um, Descartes really didn't understand Maurassian positivism. Uh, Blondel had the advantage of having met with Maurras in the 1890s, years before the dispute. Um, uh, Maurras had um, lost his faith uh, around the same time he lost his hearing as a, a teenager. And he came up, he was very gifted, young man comes to Paris to make his fortune, and there was a uh, priest uh, who uh, kept in touch with him, uh, who had taught him uh, at the collegiate level, and uh, was very concerned for him, and wanted Blondel, he, he knew Blondel, he wanted Blondel to go and talk with him, and maybe bring him back to the faith, and uh, Blondel got just very frustrated. His uh, Maurras was uh, inclining to uh, Comtean, Positivism and uh, Descartes never did a study of Comtean positivism, but you know his uh, uh, religion of humanity. It's Comte. Uh, it is kind of an idolatry, <laughs> uh, and this was uh, uh, Blondel really took the measure of uh, of Maurras, uh, Maurras's, uh, worldview much better than Descartes, uh, realizing that it was uh, not this. Uh, uh, you know, possible openness or even neutrality <laughs> to, uh, uh, to the spiritual. Um, Morassian uh, 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 Oxygen Frances, you know, is uh, criticized for wanting the, cat, wanting the Catholic shell uh, of an institutional uh, church, but gutting it of Christianity. <laughs> uh, 
Maras had these uh, you know, infamous passages, which in these books that finally did get uh, put on the index, uh, denouncing the, the venom of the Jewish prophets and the uh, Magnificat and whatnot, the, the frenzy of, uh, and there's quite, there is this anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Semitic dimension of Axiom Frances. When um, Vichy arrives in 1940, um, you can see a, a similarity of mentality between the, uh, the mindset of Axion Frances and, uh, and Vichy. And uh, Maurras supposedly remarked, uh, what a divine surprise. He was an old man, never thought he would see his, his uh, political uh, uh, vision instantiated as it was in, uh, in Vichy. So I, um, if my even-handedness, I do think it's a messy dispute, and I do think uh, Descartes had some legitimate uh, criticisms of Blondel, um, and Blondel later clarifies his position, but on the issue of uh, Action Francaise, I do, I do think uh, uh, Blondel was, uh, was right <laughs> to, to sound the toxin, what, what a threat this posed. Um, um, I, I, I do make a, um, a comparison uh, without developing it, uh, I know one, one, at least one reviewer criticized me for throwing some, some things out and not developing them. And that was, that's the, namely, a, uh, this infeodation of a political position in the church uh, that was happening on the right and making a parallel with what was happening on the left after Vatican II between a version of liberation theology um, claiming a certain kind of um, a social science uh, uh, basis uh, uh, in, in, in linking the church to the, a certain socialist position. And um, Pope John Paul, uh, I think, saw the, uh, the danger there in Nicaragua, for example. And I, I would suggest they're mirror images of each other. The uh, infeodation of the, uh, on the right uh, with Action Francaise and how it viewed the church, <laughs> uh, the Catholic uh, shell, I think, uh, in service of its ends with the way uh, in Nicaragua, the way they wanted to use the church there. Uh, <clears throat> I, I make a, a, a comparison between what I call a restorationist model of, uh, of Descartes and a transformationist model, Levin, uh, which reminds me of the, uh, the political question. Uh, Blondel was a Rallier. Um, this is instructive, I think, to see uh, from one pontificate to another uh, how things can change. Uh, Leo XIII had uh, um, really urged uh, through the uh, uh, Cardinal of Ijeri and his uh, famous uh, speech um, that Catholics would uh, work within the Third Republic to uh, bring about uh, legislation uh, that uh, you know, was in the interests of, of uh, Christian values. Um, of course, things changed then with the uh, the, the, the cartel or uh, uh, Valdec, Rousseau, and uh, Combs, mm -hmm. and they tightened the screws on the, uh, with their anti-clericalism got very strident and uh, kicking the Jesuits, uh, especially the Jesuits were the nemesis uh, off of French soil, although individual Jesuits stayed in France, but their corporate works, their schools were closed. And they, they, um, that's why uh, Deco is teaching on Jersey Island <laughs> off uh, in, in the channel. Um, and so um, I, I, he did have a political position um, with a, in supporting the Saman Social uh, was uh, having these annual meetings to um, bring together experts on uh, um, economics and workers, the workers' uh, situation, to pass legislation to promote justice uh, for the workers and whatnot. So he would have supported, certainly supported that.